Thank you very much. It is an humbling honor to be invited to speak in front of you. Uh, I'm a professor of global health, or rather, to be precise, a recently retired professor in global health. And, and I, I know that I'm not here because I know the content more than anyone else in the room, not at all. Uh, but I think I will introduce myself not as that famous data speaker, but as the most important representative in this room. I represent the patients. This photo is taken at the University Hospital in Stockholm. It's an hepatitis C patient and his doctor, Dr. Veilan, our professor in hepatology. And it's on the 16th of January 2014. Indeed, it is me. I've had a lifelong hepatitis C infection since childhood. I have a full-blown uh, cirrhosis, F4, and I was going down in decompensation 2012, 2013, after failure with interferon treatment. I was dreaming and hoping for the new hepatitis C drugs. I was in the front of the queue to get them. Yeah. And 16th of January, the first prescription ever in Sweden was written at 8.30 in the morning. And I was the patient. And I had then been searching for compassionate use of this. I tried to move to any country in the world to get into a clinical trial, but I just didn't fit. I was too sick, or I was too healthy, or I was too old, or I was too young. I just didn't fit in any clinical trial. And my problem was that I needed more than the Sovaldi. I'm a lucky man. I live in Sweden, where if you have a severe form of hepatitis C infection with a lot of complications, then indeed you get the drug free. Yeah. This is the $1,000 a day drug yeah, that I get the prescription. And I got six month free treatment. I thank the Swedish taxpayers. Yeah. But I needed the other drug also, Simiprivir. I had to go together with it. And that was still not registered in the European Union. Although it was developed at a little startup at the Karolinska Institute, my real university, just about one kilometer from where I'm working. But I couldn't get it. And I applied for compassionate use, and I didn't get it. So I had to fly to Japan. And with my dear colleague in Global Health, I was introduced and booked a time with Dr. Kusumi at the Navitas Clinic for Travel Medicine. And according to all rules and regulation, I got the three-month prescription of Simiprivir. And I paid out of my pocket. And I, fortunately, it was half price in Japan compared to Europe. And of course, I did everything legally. You are allowed in Sweden to enter the country with three month prescription of a drug that has been prescribed to yourself after seeing a doctor. You cannot go abroad to buy it. Yes, you have to see the doctor. And I was not allowed to have a, a six month drug. I had to fly back to get the last three months. So <clears throat> this is how dramatic it is. So having spent decades of my life trying to understand how drug innovation and drug supply should be organized in the world, I had to do the problem-based learning myself. <laughs> and here I am, more than one year after treatment, I'm absolutely free of hepatitis C, I'm cured. And my liver had improved. Essentially, I feel better than I've done in the last 15 to 20 years. This is really important, what you are doing. <clears throat> I was running along, along the lake this morning, and I haven't been running for 10, 15 years. So uh, I exemplify the importance of what you are doing. And I could not more than anyone else say how important it is that all people who suffer from a disease or are threatened by a disease have the same chance as I had. Yeah? As I had worked almost all my life in, in, in low-income countries and close to extreme poverty. It's humbling to have this. Simiprivir is what I got that, it's that combination uh, that, that saved me. Now, what I want to do here is instead of talking about the core issue of the, of the conference, I'm going to give you a background how the world is. How is our converging world? Uh, because I call it a converging world where countries actually are getting more and more similar. The inequities in the world are decreasing. They may be increasing within countries, but in the world as a whole they are decreasing. And I used to put questions about this, but having such a respectful audience today, I didn't distribute the answering devices to you. <clears throat> 
But I think I have some set of questions. In Gapmind, the foundation where I work, we have a factfulness project. We want to produce factfulness. Yes, it is a new word in the English language that we have offered. Huh? It is the idea that you should grasp more or less how things are. It's easier then if you base your idea of fact instead of preconceived ideas and ideologies. And just look at these questions about the world. How many out of 10 people in the world as a whole have electricity at home? Is it, is it one? Is it uh, five out of 10, that is 50%? Or is it eight, nine? Is it, it's not 100%, I can tell you. Can I have a little guess by show of hands? How many think it's one out of 10? How many think it's two out of 10? How many think it's three out of 10? How many think it's four out of 10? How many would guess for five out of 10? How many think six out of 10? How many think seven out of 10? How many eight out of 10? How many nine out of 10? It's interesting, you answered more or less the same I got. I was with Fox News in, in, in US, I was with, with the uh, conference of uh, maternal health and newborn health, I've been at big banks, it's more or less the same. Very few people get it the way it is. How many out of 10 girls in this world are in primary school? That is, primary school, the first four years or the first six years, little different in countries, meaning girls between age seven, age 13. How many out of 10 girls are enrolled in school, huh? primary school? Is it one out of 10? Is it two out of 10? Three out of 10? Four? Five? Six? Seven? Eight? Nine? It's interesting. It's good you invited me. Huh? <laughs> it's eight out of 10 that has electricity at home, and nine out of 10 girls are enrolled in primary school. You are roughly about 25 to 40 years behind your time, the way you raised your hands. <laughs> and it's interesting, because the way you answered is not like wrong. It's exactly as it was some decades ago. The world is changing. Electricity is on top of the list of families around the world. Because there are some few studies, unfortunately, but listen carefully now. Having electricity at home improved child survival almost as much as the vaccines. Just imagining how it improves hygiene. When some of the children have diarrhea or vomit during night, you can clean up before the siblings have stepped into it. Huh? And, and, and you can mend the children's clothes in the evening. So there are things competing with our drugs and vaccines in, in improving health, you know. And, and, and girls are in school, of course they are. Women across the world are fighting for their rights and they are successful, they step forward. And we don't know it, that's also very typical. Progress of women's are not recognized. Then, does it mean that gender issues is solved? Not at all. It's even worse today because the gender inequity have moved from age 7 to age 13, age 14. And then young girls and young women are stopped in the most brutal ways in so many places. So, so this way of understanding how the world has changed is important. I used to ask how many children will there be in the world by the end of this century, because UN Population Division has made a forecast on which almost all demographers agree. It's not sure, but more or less. The other three options here I have made up. Look, when I was born, there was less than one billion children in the world, children being zero to 50. It increased like this to the turn of the century, two billion children. 2,000 million children eh, in the world. Now, what happens in this world? I have asked, Gapminder Foundation have made web-based surveys in Sweden, they answer like this, Norway answer like this, uh, Britain like this, America like this. Can you see how well you can study knowledge by web-based service these days? They have about 10 seconds to reply so they can't use their smartphones. Eh? And, and you get with different web-based survey companies in different countries, you get almost the right, the same uh, response rate. 10% think that number of children have stopped increasing. 45, 30 to 40% think it will increase a little slower. And about half of them think it will continue to increase as it has. Yes, more and more children in the world every day. Now, the interesting thing is that this is the right answer.
The number of children in the world have stopped increasing. It's the biggest event in the history of mankind that was ever completely missed by media. There's so many things happening out there in the homes that media is missing, education is missing, and even a lot of highly professional people in different sectors are missing. Why is this? Because most of the young couple under their pillow has either a condom or a pill. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Eight out of ten. Remember, eight out of ten. Huh? Yeah. And how many of the world's children are vaccinated against measles? Well, this is how the Swedes answer. This is how Norway answer. This is how US answer. And this is the right answer. So one only, on, who is professor of global health in that country? <laughs> so much for my success. So much for my success in presenting data. We are in an uphill struggle of just keeping up with what happens in the world. And when you argue for your wise solution, and it's really you are in the challenge. We are proud now in Stockholm. I'm a member of the Swedish Academy of Science that picked the Nobel Prizes. We are proud to award those drugs against parasites. We are proud to award the economist now Dayton, who has studied uh, poverty, you know. And we want to award you the price in economics when you have come up with a new business model that can solve this so that we get investments into innovation and we get a business system that everyone who needs the drugs then get access and we return a profit to the investors. That's what we want to see. When you have found that out, you are welcome to Stockholm and we'll celebrate. And life expectancy in the world, what is that? This is a nice question, because I give the answer here. Japan has 83 years, and unfortunately here, I think this was two years ago, uh, 48 years last estimate for, for Lesotho. Somewhere the worst of countries are somewhere between 45 and 50. What is it in the world as a whole? In the world as a whole, life expectancy is 71 years. And the interesting thing with that is that the life expectancy of the world population is closer to the best country than to the worst country. We have a skewed distribution of health in the world that is skewed towards the best. That's for health. For economy, it's the other way around. So we in public health, we can boast, ha ha, we did better than the economist. We skewed the world health towards the better, but those who deal with the wallet they haven't been as successful. But then my friends who are professors in economics, they say, yeah, that's because you die, you know, but the real good capital, that keeps living forever, you know. So it's that limit we have for life expectancy. So no matter what, you know, eventually you will die. So let me start by showing you the income distribution of the world. Uh, we have done uh, the following uh, software here in Gapminder, and I will try to show it to you in this way. It didn't change so rapidly, because it was mostly the rich who benefited from it. Even in Britain, the children were still down the coal mine. Huh? And then it started, in the next century, it dragged away, and we got this peculiar income distribution, which was at its peak in 1970. We had the poor, and we had the rich. It was two humps. I call it the camel world with two humps. And the rich were somewhere between 10 to $20 a day in purchasing power here, and the poor was below the poverty line. This was the world I met when I was a student, and I studied in Sweden, I studied in India, and we saw the world, the income distribution of the world. After that, when it started to converge, we called it globalization. But this is the exception. Historically, this is the exception. It was a short blink of time in the history of humans. Some few generations, when some countries and regions had a distinctly different economic level from the rest of the world. That's not how it used to be. It was a few, few generations. And look what has happened here. Look what has happened when they get more people in Asia and Africa there, and now China start the drive forwards, the Asian tigers follow, the African lions follows, and there we are today. No more camel. The camel is dead. 
It's a dromedary world with was one big hump. And on the other side of the hump, still almost a billion people in extreme poverty. And the sunny side, the best of, where people get their a hepatitis C drugs as soon as they get on the market and they get them subsidized if you are a lucky sweet. This, that. And most people live here in the middle. How do we handle, how do we conceptualize this world? That's what I'm going to, to talk about here. And I go backwards there just to show you how this was distributed between the continent. As you see on the map up there, red is Asia, yellow Europe, blue Africa, green America. This was Asia, this was uh, Africa, this was America, this was Europe. West Europe, North America on that way, Japan and Australia. Gapminder Foundation is an independent organization. We stay away from, from business, we stay away from government, so we can decide which country belongs to which region. <laughs> and we decided that Australia is Asians. We think they have to get used to that. You know? <laughs> And we decided that Turkey was European, otherwise Europe would be so small. So we just recruited Turkey to get, <laughs> to get the better size of Europe. Huh? Uh, I apologize if someone is offended by, by, by this way of looking at things. Now, the interesting thing, if I mark China here and I mark the United States, can you see that back then, I can make the other ones a little this is less intense. Back then, there was almost no overlap in the 1970s. The best off in China and the worst off black people in rural Mississippi uh, were more or less on the same level. And look what has happened. In the first 20 years, from 1970 here to 1990, not so much happens. Because when China starts to grow with these fascinating numbers, 10% of year, but they grow from a low level, you don't make much difference. That's what Africa has experienced today. Very nice percentages, but percentages adding to a very low income, it doesn't bring you fast forward. You have to keep that percentages for decades and decades and decades. Huh? And, and, and here still a very modest overlap. But look now what happens when China moves on. China moves on here. Huh? And Asia follows. India is following here. Huh? And, 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 and today, Ooh. You can now see that the most Chinese are better than the worst off in the United States. The majority of the Chinese population is better there. The sort of average here, you know, somewhere here, there are still few Chinese there, but give them another two decades, another three decades, and you have a completely new world. That talk about slowing down in China is an illusion. The re you can watch the, the growth of China going down now from this 8 9% going down to 5 6%. That's a sign of success. Because I'd rather have 6% growth of $10 a day than have 9% growth of $4,000. And these countries over here just have a modest 2 or 3%. I mean, we celebrate in Europe if some country have 2% growth. So the whole concept, we have really, division is a very difficult way of counting, arithmetic, I found out. So you, you have to understand what this is. So what we saw was a converging world. Let me show you what I consider the biggest change in our time. The biggest change on our, at our time is here, babies born per woman. Back in history, it was six babies born per woman. That's the normal for humans. Breastfeeding, the way it was sort of by nature intended for humans is two to three years. And you get between the conceptions, you get about three years. You get children three to four years interval on average six per woman. Some women didn't get any children, others got many more for different reasons. But average was six. You go to the rainforest today, you see six children, five to six children per woman. And then it didn't change much from 1800, 1900. I was a college students here, 1965, there's still five children per woman in the world. And why do I take this? Yes, because decreasing the number of children per woman means confidence that children will survive. The new idea, I'm not proud of how many children I have as a father, I'm proud of how well my children are doing. And that means for parents, 
for communities, for countries, for the world, investing a lot in each child and helping them to go forward. And of course, having that condom and that pill below the pillow, you know, <laughs> to make it happen. So what has happened in the world since 1965? And these data are very good data. This is what happened. We are down to 2.5. And that's what made the number of children stop increasing, which has not been communicated. And we know that this will happen. We don't know really how fast, and we don't know at which level we will end off. Will we have two children per woman? Will the world be like Sweden or like Germany? Sweden, two children per woman, Germany, 1.5. And here, if I divided it in region, Europe, like everything that happens in Europe, didn't happen fast, it just started early. Nothing in Europe's progress was fast. It was slow, but started early. America started later. They had a baby boom, and then they came down at two. Europe is below the replacement level. With pleasant, present birth rate in Europe, Europe needs to double the immigrants and refugees that come in order to keep the population. That's why I added Turkey. Without Turkey, Europe doesn't have a chance to keep up. Yeah, I, I'm at a distance. I'm not a politician. I'm not head of an organization. I'm not a civil servant. I just stand beside and observe. Eh? And Asia, many got scared. Paul Ehrlich talked about population bomb, and then this happened. Eh, China today, 1.6. India, 2.5. The number of children in India have stopped increasing. Almost all girls. We are talking 98, 99% are in school. Of course, those schools for girls, some are of miserable quality. Some even don't have teachers every day. But the first step is you get them there. They start learning. Now quality in SDG, you read SDG goals now, it's to have quality of education. Eh? And then Africa, and many people say, well, Africa is not changing. It's just keep up. It's coming down. Change is just rapidly happening, and we know that this will happen. We don't know how fast Africa will come down. We don't know level we will end up in. But this is more or less known. And I will show you now this for countries. I will show you how it changed from the old balance when population did not grow because parents got six children on average. And it should triple, shouldn't it? Two parents get six children. Population should grow like this. This is what you see in rainforest, but you see no people. Why? Because in history and in rainforest today, tragically, four children die before growing up to become parents themselves. It's utterly tragic. Humans have never, ever lived in ecological balance with nature. We have only been dying in ecological balance with nature. People in the rainforest do not live in ecological balance in nature. They die in ecological balance with nature. Utterly tragic. For the first time in history, with the SDGs, we are seeing a glimmering hope in the future that we can live in ecological balance with nature if we produce what we need in a much more clever way and if we become sustainable. And what happened with the Industrial Revolution was not that we got less children. This is what was in Sweden 150 years ago. My grandparents, they had eight children, eight babies born. Huh? But less died, more survived. And so the Swedish population was growing. The population in the world was growing. 25% of the Swedes crossed the Atlantic as both refugees. My great-great-grandma drowned outside Newfoundland, not reaching land. We are a family of boat uh, migrants that died on the passage. Uh, some of them. And, and here, the population increased. Sweden filled up Minnesota, and we became 7 billion in the world. It's a short world history I make in this. Uh, and, and here, what we are now hoping for is to reach the new balance. The old balance was controlled by death. No good drugs, no vaccine, no good hygiene. The new balance is controlled by love that enormous ability we have due to this new technology to, dis, uh, to, to, to separate reproduction and sexuality. The, the, the intimacy of sexuality can keep a couple together, you know, and they can decide which night to make love and have sex and which night to make a baby. <laughs> and that's fantastic. Eh? It's enormously. 
Eh? Here's a man who's still married to his teenage love, you know. Uh, and, and, and having that, living with that possibility, you know, we are now seeing a new future coming. And this is an enormous change in the world, and we know that we will end up like this. There will be four billion more because of, of, of the composition of the world population. This is how we are distributed today. One billion in America, one in Europe, one in Africa, and four in Asia. And, and, and here, the PIN code is 1114. <laughs> huh? It will change 2050, no more in Europe and America, but one more in Asia. And by that, the fast population growth is over in Asia, and Africa will double its population in 35 years. Uh, and, and, and up to the end of the century, no more in America, Europe, and Asia, and probably three or perhaps four billion more in Africa. So it's very clear that the relation between Europe and Africa will change, and I have a clear advice to the Europeans already today. Start being polite to Africans. <laughs> Because anyhow, if they will be partners, friends, or enemies, anything, they will outnumber the Europeans. They will outnumber them. So it's better not irritating them. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the children will not increase, but the adults will increase. How is that possible? How can the adults increase with four billions without having any more children? We have reached peak child. It's because of this. Now this is deep demography here. Each figure here is now 100 million. 100 million people. Eh? And these are the Europeans, see, age 15, 30, 45, and 60. This is Europe, same amount of people in all age groups. These are the children, the young adults, the older adults here, and these are old people. I'm in this group, 60 plus in Europe. America, almost the same. They are just lacking retired people here in South America. It will be filled up in 15 years, they will be there. Look at Africa. Already today, more children than the entire Europe and America together. Now you see why Europe needed Turkey. Otherwise, it would be too small here. Eh? This is Africa. And even if Africa, by some strange magic or whatever, will start having two children per woman tonight, the African population will still double. Can you see that? These people are not missing because they died. Only a few because they died. Most because they were never born. This is like a population pyramid spread out. And in Asia, the number of children have stopped increasing. Remember, they had hit two. Eh? They hit two now. And Africa, children is still increasing because they are at four. So this is what happens in, yeah, you know, in spite of all your drugs, the old people die. The rest grow older and they have children. 15 years have passed. The old die, the rest grow older, and they have children. Can you see more and more children in Africa, less and less in Asia? That's why the number of children don't increase. And then the old die, the rest grow older, and they have their children. We're in 2060. The old die, the rest grow older, and they have their children. This is the inevitable fill-up of adults. The graying of the population in Asia, and then just a little later in Africa, is not due to longer life. We already live 71 years on average in this world. In China, already life expectancy is 75. It's just because of this, the demographers call it demographic momentum. We call it in Gapminder, the big inevitable fill up of adults. These people will be added anyhow. And there are these activists who are concerned about the environment who still this day say that we have to stop world population from growing. There's no way we can stop this if we are not going to start to kill. So it's very strange how low the knowledge is about this. And this is taking into consideration that fertility rates will be dropping in Africa like this. It may happen faster, but it may also be that Asian women start getting more children. It's now absolutely clear that it's lack of gender equity that makes educated Asian women marry late, if ever, and have few children. It's not China one-child policy, it's not it. China has. China has like 1.6 children per woman with that government policy, whereas Taiwan, that part of China, leave the politics out, eh, that part, they have one child per woman without any government saying anything to them. And Hong Kong has one child per woman because, because they, they, they uh, have good access to education for women, access to, to, to work, to advanced work, but patriarchal family values, which they wrongly label Asian values. They are not. 
They are all patriarchal values which we have had all over the world. Uh, and where we still have more or less, I should be more correct saying. Uh, so this is more or less how the world population. There will be longer lives also. I have filed an application to become this one, you know, because I can follow statistics for more years. Uh, and, and, and we don't know, we really don't know how fast. Africa may surprise us in a very fast progress. Uh, there are demographic institutes who say that Africa may dump down faster. So if you look at this, like this now, GNI per capita. Let me show you GNI per capita on this axis, 1,000, 4,000, 13,000, $100,000 per capita. Each bubble is a country here, huh? and this is length of life. I put it here, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. We have an enormous distribution. We have Congo there, we have Afghanistan there, we have, we have this is Qatar, to us in Sweden, it's very irritating that this is Norway. <laughs> Sweden is somewhere here, you know. They take about 5 to 8% of our medical doctors go directly to Norway after we graduate them because uh, salaries are so much nicer. People are also a little nicer in Norway. That's also irritating. Eh? <laughs> they have a more relaxed attitude. It's also a very beautiful country, so it's difficult to compete with them. But can you see that we have countries all the way? It's a converging world. It's not a developed and developing world. Please stop using the concept developing countries <laughs> because it has no meaning. If I cut this line here at $13,000, or to be precise, 12,700 GNI per capita exchange rate, these are the high income countries. It's one billion people living in the high income countries here on this side. If I draw another line at $1,000, I get the low-income countries here, 1 billion. There are still professionals who use low-income countries as a synonym for developing countries, exposing enormous ignorance about the economy. Most people in the world live in between here, 5 billion people. And that group is too big to be handled as one unit. Talking about middle-income countries is, is too big. Let's draw a line in the middle between upper and lower. That was not planned, no. Upper middle-income, lower middle-income. Can you see? Two and a half billion with China, two and a half billion with India. And can you see here how health, life expectancy, improve with money? That's why I love money. <laughs> As a professor of public health at the Nobel Prize awarding institution, I love money because we know how to use it. Uh, and if you have all the knowledge what you want to do and you don't have the money, you get very little. Even poor households need money to buy soap. Uh, and, and, and we need money, we need to see how to use it. The low-income countries have a life expectancy of 59. This is their level. Some are doing better, some are doing worse. That is how well they use their money. Lower middle-income countries, they have a life expectancy of 67. Can you see, it's eight years better. Eh? Some are not so effective in using, they have big inequities, Vietnam up there is very successful in relation to their, their low economy. Or they have failed very badly in the economic development but succeeded in the human development. Eh? In upper middle income countries, it's 74. Can you see what the difference? And, 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 and that is because a few of them are down here. But most of them, this big cluster, the front of the emerging economy, I think some analytical institutes show them the emerging pharma countries. Uh, they are up there. And this in high income countries is 79. It doesn't make sense to divide the world into developing world and develop. At least we need one, two, three, four steps. And let me show you now how is the disease burden in these four groups. This disease burden here, the total square here shows the burden of disease in Dallas. That is, early deaths and disabilities. The blue one is non-communicable diseases. The red one here is a small one, it's infections. This is injuries, 
self-harm, suicide, and, 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 and traffic accidents mainly. Can you see how this is really dominated by non-communicable diseases, as you know? Huh? And they have nice amount of money, and they have money, and most of the innovation produce the drugs which are needed here. And when it's good companies and good research, they really make breakthroughs, as we have seen. And they are charged a lot of money for them. Huh? That's this one. Let's move to the next group. Here also, non-communicable diseases are dominating. Infections are relatively small also in this area. Whereas if I go there, now non-communicable diseases is almost as big as infections. But they still have infections here. And if, I'm, if I move down there, you see infections is absolutely dominating. Now the challenge here, the challenge here, I want to show is perhaps more dramatic is here. Look at Vietnam. I will compare Vietnam to the United States. That we have done, you know, there have been historical and tragic, tragic military conflicts between these countries. But if we just, if we just take a look at, at this, same here, income on this axis, life expectancy there, and I mark the United States there. We run the United States forward, and I have to find Vietnam on this axis. This software is free of charge on the net for you to play around with. Huh? And Vietnam 1965 was there before the war, and then it ended up like this. And you can see Vietnam on their income level, world champion in this med midweight of economy. Vietnam today have the same health situation as United States had 1980. They have non-communicable diseases, they have cancer, they have hypertension, they have traffic accidents, they have mental health issues. Uh, they are just about 25, 30 years behind US in health situation. Whereas in economy, they are back at Lincoln time. They are 80, 80 in money. So if you are a minister of health, and you have taken your country out of malnutrition, out of infections, with do, good policy, education to the people, you get punished by getting a non-communicable disease burden at a very low income level where you can't deal with it, whereas you have the professionals who can deal with it. That's an enormous demanding situation for you to fix the access to drugs to that. And it also gives another message of innovation. We do not only need an innovation that produces cure and prevention for the non-communicable drugs. We also need it in the non-communicable diseases. We also need it that can cure and prevent at a very low cost level. I think the intraocular lens is one of the best examples uh, for cataract surgery. That was a fantastic innovation. And the best of all was when Indian polymer chemists could bring down the cost from $200 to 80 cent. We need market economy innovation, both in finding the new technology and bringing down the cost. Please, please fix that the cochlear implant and hearing devices can be brought down in cost with taking away two zeros. They need to be taken down because we now have countries who have this non-communicable disease burden at, 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 such a, uh, at such a low income level. And we have countries all the way through. So your work ain't easy. That's why I offer you a Nobel Prize if you succeed. Huh? Because you really have to come up with a business plans and, and stimulation to innovation which is as smart as the best biomedical in innovation. Huh? This is the drug cost. Here, people have $500 per person for drugs, $100 per person, $40, $10. You see the dramatic differences. Dramatic difference. And how can these people deal with the non-communicable diseases? I, I skip that one. No, it's just child mortality. If I do child mortality, same here, 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 falling stepwise. Please use the four group. The Global uh, Health Observatory at WHO, very wisely now, um, Tis Bermas group, they put these four income groups, and you can see the indicators in the four income groups. The poor people in the world has to be found with access also. Those, for, those people who don't have electricity, who don't have kids in school, who are not vaccinated against measles, who don't find contraceptives, they live in low-income countries, remote rural areas, and in the corner of the districts. If this is a hospital and the health centers, the poor people live in those corners. That means that this 
Sustainable Development Goal 1.1 is very challenging because to reach the last 10% in extreme poverty is really difficult. The last leap, you know, the last bit in marathon is the most difficult. It really takes a focused effort. And that's another challenge, just to get the good rug sweat we have out to everyone. I think I jumped that one. And I would like to stop with this one, showing you how the division has been done in developing and developed countries. MDG was reported only for developing countries. And there was a list for those countries who were considered developing or in developing regions, and they should report. And the others didn't have to report. Other people had said that MDG was the low-hanging fruit, whereas SDG is the high-hanging fruit, including the low-hanging fruit in the remote areas. That was never reached. So how did our system, our UN system, which I honor and like so much, I was brought up respecting the UN flag more than the Swedish flag. Yeah, I went to secondary school to Dag Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General, and as a young teenager, I was present at his funeral when he died in service. That had a great impact on us. So one of the reasons why Swedes stand up for UN is that, that, that uh, feeling. Respect highly people who work for United Nations different organs, you know, and contribute. Now, but how do we do it internally? This is how it was divided. Huh? No, let me first show you. Here I have money again. $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, on a log scale, of course. Compressed the money there, expanded the money here. Here's child mortality on a log scale. Two children dead, 20 children dead, 200 dead. See, once more, why I love money. The main determinant of falling child mortality is money. But you can do distinctly different at one income level. If you have a good health system, you are down here. Otherwise, you are up there. That is what we want with policy. But policy can only do so much. This bottom, no one lives here. There is no paradise. You can't have a paradise with low GDP per capita. Don't even think about it. And you can't have so stupid policies you end up here. If you are rich, you know, most kids survive. There's no way you can be so ugly in your, in your policies you end up there. Now, how do we divide it? These are the developing, these are the developed. Where is the cutoff? And this is the official cutoff in the MDG. It came down like this. It would cut here, we thought. But then Qatar is over here. And Qatar have palm trees, so they became developing. And then it goes down here. This is Kuwait. This is South Korea. They are developing. And strangely enough, Singapore, one of the most advanced countries in the world, is a developing country that have to report. And, and then coming up here, you can see that this is Ukraine and this is Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka, of course, is a developing country, but Ukraine is developed. Have you ever seen a cutoff line that goes like this? <laughs> Do we have anyone who can write the algorithm for this line? This is the intellectual quality of our categorization of the world. It's a result of a political process, and I respect it. I don't criticize outside UN me meetings. Inside, I'm harsh. Inside, I'm harsh, because I love UN. We can't work with this. You can't have a policy for those countries which are on that side of the line and another policy for the others. Leave it. Stop using it. Uh, follow. And the, 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 the big pharma is more analytic. They segmentize the world. But they don't segmentize it perfectly. I know Gilead will be here in the afternoon. I learned a little from Gilead how they say, we can't have different policies in multi-tier pricing in Latin America because it's the same language and it will be export. You have to consider other things also. You can't only have a cutoff. You have to be a little more clever. But this, we can't move forward. We must have a fact-based worldview. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Andrew Blatiak. I'm from the Polish Academy of Science. Uh, I'm a great admirer of your work, and you cheer me up. Every time I listen to you, I think the world is a better place. What, what does depress me still are drugs and narcotics and the way drugs are used in a criminal way. I would welcome your thoughts 
or any considerations that you may have on, on this and the influence on the graphs you've demonstrated? Uh, I am not an analyst in specific areas, so I try to avoid becoming guru, you know. What I really want to do is like the basic roadmap of, of the modern world to provide it. But what we can see be, behind the, the, the drug trade is that some rich countries provide a market. And if a rich Europe provide a market for, for heroin, eh, or, or United States provide a market for, for narcotics from America, there's no way the other countries can stop it. The market is very strong. We see it with, with, with the unfortunate refugees from the Middle East. When, when Europe provides asylum, a right for asylum, and deny people a visa so they can travel safely, you know, we get these tragic boat accidents. It's difficult to have a global policy that works when we still have such a lot of inequity between countries. And what I say with the progress I see in the world, and let me say I didn't have time to really show the progress in Africa. What you see in many African countries now is that the upper quintile, the top of the countries, are progressing very successfully, while they may still have rural areas in deep problems or neighboring countries in civil war. Uh, when you see that happening, it's really, it's really that West Europe and North America will be such a small part of the, of the future world. It will be less than 10%. It's marginal. The world will be Asia and Africa. That will be more than 80% of the world population. The center of trade will be the Indian Ocean. The center of world will not be London. It will be Dubai. Uh, and and, and how, would, how would, I put it like this, how would West Europe and America integrate into the modern world to find its place? Because they're very useful, stable nations, you know, have great research institutions, have great civil societies, uh, institutional, but still have, um, I have to be polite when you're in Geneva, how would you put it? In West Europe and North America, there is a toxic combination of arrogance and ignorance that leans against each other. Uh, it's a toxic combination of arrogance and ignorance. And, and what is not seen, that the young talent in Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America is at an almost higher level than you find in West Europe and North America. Poland may be, may be an exception because you are fighting so hard to catch up after those challenging decades, you know? And we are seeing that in Sweden, that, that, that Poland is, is, is catching up amazingly fast. But in West Europe, yeah, we are good at making Minecraft, Spotify, you know, all these nice software, they grow out of Stockholm. Play around, we are good at. Even these softwares I use, made by my son and his wife and the team in Stockholm. Creative innovation, but when it comes to serious work, it's the rest of the world. And how to, how to integrate that, that's a difficult thing. And, and, and make policies that works for the world. And you take up the, the most dramatic ones. But I would like to add, add the rest. I see so many, because I lecture, this lecture I deliver at the highest level in the financial sector, the big banks, and the corporations. And they are very much focused now on hiring the young talent in, in the emerging economies and even beyond. IBM go and look for, for talented programmers in uh, Savannah Valley in Kenya. You know, that, that Africa is catching up at amazing speed in software development also today. Hey, it's very challenging. We all depend on you here in the United Nations. You have to put the regulations. And, and the treatise is very difficult to find out now because it's not just two groups any longer. In Kyoto, it was still developing in developed countries. There's no such thing any longer. There's the upper middle income countries that have their interests. I worked in, with, with intellectual property in the cassava plants in agricultural research, where Brazil wanted to sit on the intellectual property of a crop that is more important in Africa. There was a lot of conflict in between that. And it's not south-south. Don't make it simple that it's south-south. It's upper middle income against low income. Eh? It's lower middle income against fragile nations. There are so many different settings. And, and, and you just have to be very clever and competent. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any more comments? Uh, uh, please, Marisol. Thank you really very much. It's one of the best presentations I never saw at the UN. <laughs> I, 
Please, could you explain a little bit more about, because you mentioned at the very beginning that inequalities are decreasing in the world, but uh, are increasing with some countries. And we see, for example, in Europe, countries that are going through crisis and how this uh, differences between population and, for example, in France the other day I listened, there are 8 million people in, in the poverty level for, for a population. Yeah. So how this can affect, for example, in the case of access to medicines for those countries which uh, population basically are uh, suffering from NCDs? Thank you. Yes, you use the term poverty. And remember that poverty used in nations who are better off, the high income, is relative poverty. It's 60% of the median level. Do you know which country in Europe that reduced poverty most in the last three to four years? It was Greece. Because Greece decreased the median income so much that the poverty line, you know, fell below the poor people. <laughs> it's, very, it's, very, it's very complicated, these terms, because they are very loaded politically and policy-wise. That's why we want to visualize the income distribution this. With this tool, you are going to see each country where, where, how they are distributed. And, and, and of course, access to drugs, if they are going to be out of pocket, is very much dependent on, on your income. And the most tragic thing with drug access out of the po pocket is that it's almost the main cause of pushing people back into extreme poverty. That's why we need protection, you know, because when you have your, your, your mother have a stroke, you know, your father need a drug for this treatment, people will sacrifice. And you see these lower middle income countries where there is now uh, successful access to, to good medical technologies and still severe diseases. I, I, I was super, co-supervisor for a study on suicide and suicide attempts in Vietnam. It's very tragic how young women who now wanted a modern life and they were stopped at the age 15, at the age 17, you know, and in panic and sadness, they tried to commit suicide. But they survived and they were brought to intensive care with very advanced treatment and the family had to pay. So it ended up by the family falling down into deep poverty. It's a very dramatic situation you see in countries. And never before have we had people at such a low income level understanding and having physical access to the payment. The big problem in the world is this. People are much more capable than their incomes. In West Europe and North America, you find a lot of people who are less capable than their incomes. They get more paid than they are capable of, or compared on it. Don't smile from Africa now. <laughs> Hide that nice smile. <laughs> you have to become some more billions because you, before you can smile like that. Yeah. Because you all know it. You know? We know when, when, when we collaborate. My colleague who is with me here, uh, Helena Nordenstedt, uh, who is also an assistant professor at Karolinska Institute, working with me with Ebola. She told me, you know, the payment level of the so-called volunteers who came from Europe was above the qualified physicians in the West African countries and the access to treatment was excellent. How many were there? 23. 23 so-called volunteers from West Europe, North America was infected with Ebola. They were flown out, no one died. Whereas our colleagues in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea, more than half of them died. Because they don't have that right. So, so uh, that, that is really tough. So we are dealing with a world where people live on very many different levels. And indeed, in a certain way, I can't accept that countries in sub-Saharan Africa should focus on, on equity so much. They should focus at the level of the poorest people. If their elite are software developers on international levels, if they have surgeons, you know, who are full capability, they must have a salary level which is somewhere close to international uh, alternatives. Otherwise, they won't work. They can go out of their position by lifting all groups at the same time. With the, with the remaining disparity. What is bad if they have leaders who only focus on the rich one and leave the rest. But I think if you look at some of the most successful countries now, like Ethiopia, uh, uh, which is doing very well, fulfilling all the MDGs, the income distribution of Ethiopia is not shrinking because now it's a, it's, it's a hot area for investments. 
Every bank I lecture till, they want to hear about these successful countries in Africa. They want to pour money into Africa now, which will make it possible for the elite, the young talent in Africa, to get better salary and move forward. And they will drag their countries out of poverty. Remember, Britain did it with their own children in the coal mines. As ugly as Britain, we will never be. Uh, that we can't have back. But, but to think that you can start, first start to have equality, that's Pol Pot. And no one wants Pol Pot back, you know. We, we need to have some sort of inequity in the countries. And you need to start to provide advanced medical service, you know, for heart and, and cancer and so on in your country before you can provide it to everyone. That's why the universal health coverage, to me, is a Sunday concept. It's a Sunday or Friday for that time, for that beam. Friday concept, you know. It's an aspiration. But Monday morning, you need that bloody budget. Because otherwise, people won't work or you won't get the drugs. So we have to define what is the universal health coverage in the world. So far, it's only one thing. It's only one thing that everyone got, it's polio vaccine. That's for everyone in the world. Eh? And that was a bad priority, sorry to say. I don't criticize it outside this meeting, but inside. You go to northern Nigeria to a woman in a remote village and, and you offer polio vaccine and she looks at her priority list and she finds in on place 42. And she says, I want diarrheal treatment, I want vaccines, you know, my sister died in childbirth, my husband has a broken leg. I, we have all these. It had to be not polio plus, it had to be basic health service plus polio. It was a wrong policy option. That's not how we will, we, we will improve. We have to listen to the priority of the people, and they know fairly well. I've been working 20 years with African institutions in remote parts of Africa. It took me 10 years to realize that I should listen and not talk. And pe people are so aware. They're so aware of their economy. They know lean economics, how to, how to make priorities and what is most important. And that you have to deal with at the same time. At the same time, you need to run clinical trials in countries. You need to have an expertise. You need to have international competitive researchers in low-income countries. At the same time, you have their villages at that low level. And I, I think it's very important not just to, to say that, that, that uh, yeah, we want equity, we want these nice things immediately. It won't come. I asked uh, Nkosa Sana de Lima Suma that invited me to the African Union. And I asked her, what is the difference being a leader in South Africa and being it in Addis for the whole of Africa? Well, back in Pretoria, we had money. Here, we don't have the money, she says. We have very meager resources, and we depend on others. So it's good we have the Europeans and the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians, so we are a little more independent these days because we have money coming from different sides. So it's extremely difficult to do this. And there, there if, you can, if you can find you know, rational ways of, of, of getting drugs cheap to these countries is very important. But at the same time, we have to accept, I should make political statement, it's intellectually um, incomprehensive not to offer cancer treatment for the better off, not to offer that treatment. Uh, and, and, and you can't do that free of charge. There's no way. And you must have pride, because the worst thing is, take a middle-sized African country, if they don't offer cancer treatment, people will fly out to Juburg, they fly to Dubai, they fly to London, and you lose that money. It's better you have that private hospital in your country, and you have that capable people in your country for the economy. So I am, though I am, can you imagine, you know, public health professor from tax loving Sweden having 50% of the economy as tax. But when I analyze, I see that you have to have both at the same time. And can we have so that we have one cheap basic forms of, for instance, insulin that is available for everyone who gets diabetes, and then those most advanced injection things, which are very nice now with automatic testing, that's for payment, out-of-pocket payment. I know that some of the companies, Novo and so on, have developed this way of having one product which exists on two price levels. And we, even, as was said, Margaret was very clear, companies who run on, on, on investment money must make profits. And they must find clever way in which they can earn a little money of providing at a very low cost to the many, a little surplus. And then they can earn more money on the others who, who try to pay it. Can I tell a story? <laughs> I have some radical students in Sweden. 
They say, aha, so you lecture to the big pharma. Yes, I do. Eh? I will go and lecture to Novartis now, uh, Novartis in Boston. But they don't provide the drugs for the poor. Well, they do something. They don't do enough. They should focus. First, they should buy, provide for the poor. But I say, Volvo don't provide ambulances for the, for the poor countries. So why do you expect them? No, because drugs is more important. You should hit them, they say. Should I hit them? Yes. If you are courageous, you should hit them. OK, I'm courageous. Just tell me, who should I hit? I will come in there to their, to their, their, their plans. Should I go on hitting the, the employees? No, 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 don't the employees. Hit the CEO. <laughs> well, this was the time of Daniel Vasela. He's a little older than me, and so on. Yeah, I may hit him. I can hit him. Are you, will things get better if I hit Daniel Vasela? Yeah, yeah, the radical said. And someone was more clever, said, no, 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 no. They'll just change him. Hit the board, they say. In fact, I'm going to lecture to the board in the afternoon. I can't make all of them. The security will probably catch me after I've hit a number of them, you know? But it will make a good video, I say. Huh? Should I hit the board? And then some clever guy in the back row said, no, you should hit the shareholders. Because the shareholder elects the board. Yeah, now you are talking, I said. And who are the shareholders in the big pharma? It's the pension funds in the rich countries. You all go home and hit grandma. <laughs> and hit her really hard. Because the money that grandma saved on her pension and give to you so you can travel in the summer, that is the profit of the drugs from come from that. You see, this is the complexity. We need a system that works. We need regulations that works. We don't need this old ideology. And for that said, the radical left I had among my students, I find equal stupidity on the radical right that says, oh, we make a patent, you should honor the patent. Don't start with generic drug, continue to honor the patent forever. That's stupid. After 20 years, honor a patent. Those who did that research are already dead or retired. <laughs> you should honor fast in some way. You should have funds for those who do things, you know. In, in business, you know, money that comes after 20 years doesn't send the right signal. It doesn't send the right signal. So what we need is a clever system. So that can, oh, and the world is as unequal, and it is, you can't change the world. You can just operate in the world as it is. Thank you, Hans. I think I stopped there, otherwise, well, I relectured all day. Thank you very much. Okay.